Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet, powered by Revolution of One, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations, and today is no different. Today we have a powerful and special guest on the program with us. Today we got the legendary poet, writer, and artist, the good brother, Black Ice. How you doing today, King? Oh, man, brother, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm, happy. I'm, I'm a fan, so I'm happy to be on here, you know, building with you, kicking it with you. I've been watching you uh, build these platforms up. Uh, and keep them going and your consistency and just not just consistency in posting, but just the content. Mm. It's always quality, it's always quality food, you know, and uh, these algorithms and social media you know, are, are feeding everybody so much junk. You know, it's just very, very um, refreshing. You know, when I when when I when your page comes up or I pull up on your on, on your on any of your pages, there's always some food there. Mm. And, I, and I appreciate that. So, of course, when you when you reached out, that's a no brainer, man. And it's a blessing to have you. And I, I receive that. And I really appreciate that. And it's a blessing to have you on. Um, This has been a, a long time coming, a long time in the making. We've been trying to make this happen. So it's a blessing that we can sit down today and have a powerful conversation. Um, so, I, I was telling you, I had saw a, a poetry uh, slam that you had did. Uh, it was, I think, nine months back in Philly. And um it really hit me. And I was just like, man, I got to reach out to the, but I got to see if we can sit down and mm. have a conversation because um, the way you broke down your life in somewhat of a chronological order, um, the vulnerability, um, just you getting up on the, uh, on the stage and being like, man, I'm nervous. I haven't performed in a while. And I mean, a season, you know, poet like yourself, I don't, mm. I don't even think they get nervous. Like I, I wouldn't expect anybody like you to get nervous. You know what I'm saying? Anytime I always. perform poetry, I always get nervous. Like, and I'm just like, when yeah, is this going to go away? But Never. it's just like you, you execute it in just the level of vulnerability that you go like on some master MC, master poet type stuff, the way you move in the crowd and stuff. And I'm just like, but the subject matter is what really hit me. And I was just like, man, I gotta, I gotta get this brother on. Like he just, he just, I, I could tell he vibrating on another level. I tell you he hit another epicenter in his journey and he, something is expanding. Like, and, and um, I really appreciate you coming on with me uh, today. And I was going to ask you, uh, my first question was about that nervousness. Do you, um, was that just due to um, you, 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 um, not performing for a while or is that just something that always keeps you present does it keep mm, you humble what is that i'm mean? nervous i'm i'm nervous right now mm. you know um uh and i think the nerves uh just shake you present mm. right uh the nerves says that when the nervousness is there it says that the ego is being parented you know mm. when the nerves there it says I'm I'm right here I'm present and my intention because the nerves are there now my intention has to be pure because mm. uh, 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 the nerves are um, yeah they'll, they'll get you so I I'll always get it like it's funny because right now like my before show uh, usually like the day of the show mm. wake up and. I feel I feel probably stoic, mm. right? I'm stoic, and then, um, you know, like probably around I, I decide what I'm going to wear. I usually wear I don't unless there's like a special event. I don't do wardrobe. Whatever I put on that day is what I'm putting is what I'm going on stage with because uh, I never knew I never do new clothes uh, on uh, when I'm when I'm performing because I gotta. They, they they don't have me in them, you know. So I have to be completely comfortable, and um, so I I decide what I'm wearing, and um, right about three three hours four hours before the show, I don't want to do it. Mm. You know, not that I don't want to do the show. I just my energy at that point is like it's erratic. There's a lot of background noise in my head that you know it's 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 that thing. It's like oh man, you know, what am I? What poems I want to do? Am I going to remember these poems? Like all of the things that I know will naturally come. It's just the process. Right about, you know, an hour before I hit, um, my, you know, the Eminem happens. My palms are sweaty. I'm saying, you know, like, I don't, you know, my stomach don't be queasy, but my palms be sweaty. Mm. There's a 
exciting nervousness about it. And once I get into the venue, then I then I really get nervous mm. because now I see who I have to serve, Woo. you know, and who I have to exchange with. So, and I want and I want it to be a a beautiful exchange. So, uh, and then people are coming and expecting, right? And a lot of times they don't know what they expect, mm. you know, and they don't. I'm I'm expecting to be fully me on stage. And so, but once I hear the energy, once I jump on stage, the minute I jump on stage, it's I'm home. You know, I'm home. I've, 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 I was, I'm a barber by trade. So my life is all, I've been an artist all my life. My, my art has always been on display. Uh, so that I'm not used to. I'm, I mean, that I'm not a, a, a alien from. It's just always been who I, you know, who I am. I've never, I never, I was never striving to be anybody other than Lamar, you know, so I didn't, you know, I, there was, I, I didn't have, um, I didn't have artist dreams, right? I didn't have, like, I didn't, there was no point in my life when I was like, oh, I want to grow up to be, you know, to be a rapper. I want to grow up to be, it's like, no, that's who I am. I'm an artist, you know, now, however, the, the, and this is my mom, you know, my mom never, ever, uh, allowed, she never asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my um, elementary school teacher, she demanded uh, uh, my classmates and I to know who we are. Mm. You know, they, that was, they said that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest detriments that we give our, that we, that we program our children with is this imagination thing. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? that's so far fetched, you know what I'm saying? You know, and you mm. get a child chasing something that they're not even they're in no way, shape or form familiar with. So you ask a child, my mom always asked my brothers and I, who are you? Mm. Like, who are you right now? Because that is who you are. You know, so I've always been an artist. I never was trying to be an artist. I never was like, I was just being me. And in being me, all these other things happened, you know, mm. and uh, it, none of it was a surprise. Uh, always humble, always thankful uh, that that I have the gifts and the responsibility, but it's never been a surprise because I've always been an artist, mm. you know, and I've always been uh, above average. You know, Do you feel like... Do you feel like that nervousness could be brought on by the art of poetry? I mean, because it's like I've heard you say it in plenty of interviews. It's like a strip down, you know, um, um, some some other arts like, you know, uh, it, it could be like a performance or, or you putting on a front. But poetry is like a revealing art. And um, I don't know if like did you ever have an ego ego issue with, with, with performing did you ever have to get into or were, did you ever get into an ego space at a certain point in time to help calm the nerves like yeah I got this I'm I'm him I'm him but you know when I hear you speak about poetry it seems to be more of like an authentic stripped down it's just like it's raw like it, it can't be done that way for you the, um, the one time my man John Barber <laughs> the one time I was uh this is before I was black, before I, you know, came up with it, before I was given the name Black Ice. Mm. Um, and uh, my man, John Barber, had a joint and I was I was in my ego that night. You know, I had mm. made, I, you know, very early off in my in, in this chapter of my artistic career, the, 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 the performance poetry chapter, because I was still a barber by trade. And at this at that point, at that at that juncture, I was leaving the barbershop and this was, and the poetry set was my safe haven mm. because it was where I got to go and express all of the things that I was frustrated about mm. with black male America, you know, uh, because I worked at a barbershop. We, we are, we are on the pulse of black male America and we, and we cut every, we were a celebrity barbershop. So we cut everybody from the biggest drug dealer to Randall Cunningham to the biggest pastor in the city, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, and, and, and that was a show, 
in itself. Like it's, my life has always been art. Like the, the barbershop is an absolute show. For me, it was, you know, like what you wear, how you style around the chair. There's an art to moving that chair around with your knees and not touching it with your hands. The way mm. you the clippers, you know, some cats cut hair like this and other cats mm. they hear with it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, and all, cu- you know, your audience, the customers catch all that and moving around that. A chair, like, mm. it's all crazy. It's a show, and how you dip down, and you all of that attracts. That was all the art. That was the performance part of it, and then the, the finished product is the art. You know, mm. so um, uh, for me, so the ego, um, John Barber. I'm at this spot. I made a little, you know, making a little teeny name. And and the audience was feeling the poem that I, the, the couple of poems I did, but we were we were on a time constraint, mm. and I was just kind of really arrogant. I was like, "Man, y'all want another poem, don't y'all?" You know, they're like, "Yeah." And then John Barber, it's his show. He comes up, he's like, "Man, we ain't got time," and I'm literally like, mm. back and forth with the mic, right? They said they wanted another one, <laughs> you know, and I went in to do the poem and fumbled and couldn't remember and it was the most embarrassing mm. uh performance i've ever had and i never had another performance like that you know like that was the one time that my ego that i i wasn't parenting my ego i didn't have my my ego uh, in, in its place because the ego is necessary you know, I don't I don't subscribe mm. to that. Oh, we have to kill our ego. It's, you can't. Mm. Your ego is necessary. You know, your ego is your is your oomph. As mm. we get older, you have to parent your ego. It's a child. You know what I'm saying? The ego is what makes you jump off the roof onto the pissy mattress. Mm. You know, the ego is what makes LeBron hop out the gym. The ego is what pushes me on stage. Uh, knowing the skill set that I had. That's the ego. Mm. You know, the ego is all of your, your oomph. It's all of your, like, go out and get it. No fear. You know, uh, uh, your relentlessness, your, your, your veracity, that's all your ego. And it's very necessary. You know, ego is your, your ego is also your, 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 your champion, your show, your soldier, the soldier in you, the warrior in you. Mm. You know, it's the, the ego is what is what allows you to take a punch and give one back. Mm. You know, that's the ego. So once you have it parented, then you be that's manhood, you know, to me. So that was the one time that and it was it was like super humbling, like because I like, man. And then I went into the poem and man, it was horrible. Mm. And then as I was done, John Barber looked at me like. <laughs> so, what do you, what do you think makes it so hard to uh, not hide behind it? You know, the ego. What what do you think makes it so hard? Because I I, I noticed for me, um, it is it, exactly what you said. It has a time and a space, and I and that was one of the questions that I had. Like, you know, does it have a space um, where it is is warranted? But um, I find when criticism comes. For me personally, Mm -hmm. um, I like to hide behind what I do well. You know what I'm saying? Instead of addressing what I don't do well. And it's it's a balance because sometimes I feel like if I'm not acknowledged for what I do well, then I have to reintroduce it to you. I have to Mm -hmm. get you to to acknowledge the fact that I do these things well, when maybe that's just not the point of the conversation. That's not the point of what's going on. But I feel like if you don't acknowledge it, then the greater perspective isn't to the problem at hand, but Absolutely. maybe that's just your ego. Then maybe that's just my ego in the moment, like not trying to be humble. Like it's just humility. And what, what, what do you find? What do you, what do you find is, is, is the hardest part of, of just like not hiding behind it, but embracing it in moments where it, it needs mm. to be present. Mm. All right. So, um, at one point, like back maybe 2009, 2010, I had moved back to Philly from Newark. I was living in Newark for a second. I moved back to Philly and I decided to hop back in the barbershop. Mm. Um, 
for inspiration, but also, you know, it's a hustle, you know, and I love cutting hair. So uh, things were slowing down, you know, so I know I do what I know best. OK, let me let me go get on my corner, you know, and 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 the Clippers was, you know, the Clippers was my drug. Mm. And so um, I was talking to my mom. And uh, and I said, well, I'm going back in the barbershop. And she's like, why? And I said, well, you know, uh, just because I got to reconnect. And uh, I was making, you know, I was kind of making excuses. Um, outside of the money. Mm. And she said, well, Lamar, she said, I'm not, I'm not um, opposed to you being a barber. A barber is a great thing. You know, a barber is in service to his community so on and so forth. She said, but I think that you've hit, she said, I think you've hit a stumbling block. And now you're afraid of your greatness. Mm. So you're going back to what's safe. Mm. I was like, damn. You know, like, so that's the, you know, like that, that, that humility. And then also as a, I had a sis tell me one time, because you know, as poets, we get into this hoteptacon, kind mm-hmm. of, right? You know, I call them hoteptacons because, you know, a lot, it'd be a lot of frauds, a lot, a lot, a lot of frauds, a lot of I'm deep, wide and heavy because I got a crystal mm-hmm. wrapped in copper hanging around my neck. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of cats, you know, in the poetry scene claim to be well read, but you only read, you read 25 pages of that book. You didn't read the whole book. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like we can't really, we can't really build. You know, you know, it's it's for show. Like I, I actually, like I study. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> I, I study, and um, and so uh, yeah, I got, I was, I was definitely, and she said, yeah, she said, don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid of your greatness. And then a, a, a sis told me one time at a spot, and she was giving me comp, you know, she's giving me a compliment on the work, uh. And and I was I was very just you know like almost like cliche humble, mm. right? Like I was super cliche humble. Oh, thanks, mm. give thanks, sis, and you know, and uh, and then when she would give me, oh no, well you know, this, I'm just. And he, she said, brother, say thank you. Mm. Say thank you. Those are your gifts. Own them. You know, it's not arrogant to own your gift. And so this is where we have to find that balance. And as poets, you know, there's a whole persona in our community, right? So people come in uh, trying to be poets, right? You know, you have cats like, I'm going to be a poet. Then you Mm. ain't a poet. Mm. Because either you are or you ain't. Damn. Damn. You know, either you are or you ain't. One or the other. You know, there is no. Oh, I'm. I am. I am. Uh, I'm working on being a poet. Nah. You know, if anything, you're a poet working on being yourself. Hmm. Because that's mm. what we do. Like, we are not actors. We are not rappers or singers or uh, visual artists. Um, our life, our responsibility. Sonia Sanchez said to me and Jessica Care, Jessica Care Moore and I in um, Wisconsin one uh, one year years ago. She said, "You know, to be a poet uh, is to be extraordinary and ordinary at the same time." Mm. You know, and uh, our our responsibility is the truth, and that's where the strip. That's that's where the stripping naked comes into play, being being uncomfortably, being comfortably vulnerable. You know, uh, and that takes and that took years. Uh, No, it didn't take years. What took years was me finding out how to how to maneuver it and utilize it on stage. All of me, my Mm -hmm. silly side. The serious, like how to how to drive points in, you know, uh, where to let it breathe. These things had to be learned and practiced. Mm. But I've always been vulnerable. 
I've always been, I've worked at a barbershop. The barbershop is one of the realest places you can ever work at. Mm-hmm. You know, and we had a brotherhood. So there was no fronting and code switching. So, uh, you know, and when I when I go, go back to the barbershop, I don't get the, oh, Mar got new ones. I'm the same Mar. You know, I'm the same Mar, same, same cat I've always been. Uh, just evolved and gained some wisdom, you know, right? So, but the core of me is still the core of me. It's that same, the core of me, I still feel like the little boy that was playing kickball at the, you know, uh, at the boys club. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing part, there's nothing about me that feels spiritually any older than 18. Mm-hmm. I still have all my virility. I still have all my my excitement, my enthusiasm, uh, my sense of humor. Life hasn't beaten me down, you know. Um, and I've had, you know, in, in my life ain't been no fairy tale. I just mm. never let it beat me down, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, it w- with us, it's, it's our responsibility is to just to be honest, and then also to be honest artists with the intention of being, of feeding and exchanging with our audience on stage and also being dope. Mm. God, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to get on stage, if I ain't going to be dope, what's the, what's the point? You know, uh, and I'm one that, I'm a snob. So and I'm a snob about my art form. And I feel like the same way Kobe was a snob about basketball. <laughs> you say the same way uh, Denzel and Samuel and Eddie Murphy are snobs about what they do because we're masters. So I'm, I don't, I don't believe in the six. I don't believe in the participation ribbon. You know, either you are or you ain't. And mm. that's not to say that, uh, you know, uh, and everybody can't be. Mm. You know, everybody can write a poem, but everybody can't, everybody can't perform a poem. Mm. That takes something different. That takes a comfortability in being yourself. That takes a, a, a bravery. Um, yeah, it takes a bravery uh, uh, and an acceptance, a self-acceptance, you know, to get on stage and say, hey, this is me. You know, is there... Is there a difference between a wordsmith and a poet? Because I've heard you describe yourself as both. Is, is there a difference between the two? Um, well, you have poets, right? Uh, you have poets, you have academia poets, mm-hmm. you know, who follow all of the rules. You know, like written poetry is very rule heavy, right? Mm-hmm. Order heavy, so on and so forth, where performance poetry is usually prose or free verse. And uh, so a wordsmith to me, I've changed the, I've, I've switched up that, that, uh, that term. Right. Mm-hmm. And I call, you know, like I call my peers, heavy talkers. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk heavy. Me, Saul Williams, Jessica Caremore, Amir Suleiman, Sonny Patterson, Lemon, uh, uh, Red Storm, Tommy Bottoms, Abyss, Cola Rum, my man, Will the Real One, rest in peace. Like, uh, we we heavy talkers, you know, and I and I the analogy I draw is that you know, you got people who go to uh, Juilliard and learn how to tap dance, right? Mm-hmm. And they can tap dance, and then you got cats like my man uh, Maurice Chestnut from Newark and Savion Glover. They mm-hmm. hook. I don't know if you ever heard that term. Like tap dances, you, you hear real. Real tap dancers like uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was a hoofer. Sandman mm. from Apollo was a hoofer. The Hines brothers, hoofers. There's a mm. difference. Right? So that's the same thing with, with poets. With, with You have cats that are poets who can get up there and recite their poem. And, and then you got heavy talkers mm. who get up on stage and really give you themselves like really give you who they are like they do we we do some things that other cats just can't do mm. the thing that Saul does that nobody else can do 
There's a thing that Sonny Patterson does that nobody can duplicate. Amir Suleiman, nobody can duplicate what he does. There's a thing that I do that nobody can duplicate what I do. You know, um, and that's a very natural thing. So yeah, I call I call I call my my peers heavy talkers. So that and that's the difference. That's a word a wordsmith. Uh, and now that you got me thinking about it, I'm like, man, you know what? A wordsmith might even be something separate from that, mm. right? You got poets, wordsmiths, and then you got heavy talkers. Mm. You know, uh, like you got you got Kenny G. As a jazz, you know, jazz player, you got Kenny G, and uh, then you got uh, um, there's another level in between there. It's like uh, maybe a George Duke and uh, like Sam Bourne, but then you got Coltrane, Thelonious, Miles. Mm-hmm. They were sound scientists, right? You got jazz musicians, and then you got sound scientists. Mm. They do things with their instruments. They speak a language with their instruments that we don't get. And it's the same thing with, with, with but that's with, with any walk of life, right? Mm. Any walk of life, you got MCs, you got some cats who can rhyme, and then you got Rock Him. You know, you got some cats who can rhyme, and then you got KRS-One. You got some cats who can rhyme, and then you got Kendrick. And you got J. Cole, you know, you got Odyssey, and you know, Rhapsody. These are different artists. That you know, that it's a you know, you got cats who can play ball, and then you got LeBron, mm. Jordan, and Kobe. Like, so I, I come up, my mom never allowed my brothers and I to uh play that game with ourselves. Like, you know, she would tell us, you know, contrary to what the world is going to tell you, you cannot be whatever you want to be. That is a lie. Mm. What you can do is you can. You can master who you are, and then you can be the most phenomenal, you know, what your natural skills, gifts, and talents are. You can master them, and then you can be the most phenomenal person within your natural self, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to play. I I didn't really want to play ball. My brother played ball. I was never an athlete. My brother played ball. I only wanted to play ball because of the uniform. I thought the uniforms were slick. You know what I'm saying? So, but I had no interest in none of that shit. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to learn, you know, plays. I didn't want to, none of that. I just wanted the, the uniform. My mom supported it until that first game or the first game she came to because she waited like six games. And then when she finally came to a game, you know, I got out there because I would only get on the court if we was up 30 or down 30. Mm, damn. You know, and I got on the court, inbound the ball to me. All I knew was that I had to get past that half court line. <laughs> That's all I was like. <laughs> I wasn't listening to no plays. I was trying to make it past the half court line so I could shoot the ball. It was very much a game, you know, it was playgrounds to me. And so after that game, because I was only in there for about 10 seconds, because mm. <laughs> I shot the ball. The next timeout, Manson, sit down. Like, and and so on the way home, on the bus, my mom said, Lamar, you are not an athlete. Mm. You are an artist. I was maybe eight years old. Mm. You are an artist. You you can draw, you can dance, you can act, you are a writer. This that is who you are. Mm. You are not, your brother is an athlete, you are not. And and I I think I'm probably most thankful. That's one Mm. of the things I'm most thankful for her uh, because she didn't allow, she didn't allow my brothers and I to lie to ourselves. And because Mm. she didn't, we didn't, we didn't lie to ourselves at that core place, we didn't allow the world to lie to us. Mm. You know, so. Uh, yeah, man, I just always been, uh, it's always been, uh, uh, just about honesty, man, really about honesty, getting to my most honest self every day. I try to be the, a, a better Lamar. Some days are better than others. 
<laughs> you know, some days I really drop the ball. Um, but that's life, you know, mm-hmm. is is being able to being able to sit in that and be accountable for it. You know, the only time you can't grow is if you deny it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's do you feel cool. like do you feel like um art in in, in um black culture has lost a sense of um uh a sense of groundedness you know a sense of oneness a sense of knowing what we are like you said like you, you, your mom telling you like no nah, that's not you this is you this this a sense of principle a sense of foundation because when i think about um the 90s i think about the 80s when i when i think about that era i i, I think about um I just think about love. I think about the colors. I think about just mm. the swagger that we had, you know, the, the black love. And, and, mm. and when we watched those old TV shows, like it was just, it just, it just, you know, you got the purple with the red, you know what I'm saying? With the yellow. And it's just like with the black jacket, you know what I'm saying? You got all these, it's just, it was, you got the, the black hairstyle. You just got, you got that love. It was like that juice in the berry. Like it was just rich. Mm-hmm. It was just like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I don't know what 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 would happen to that sense of that. And I don't know if that's just a natural evolution. Like people be like, well, our previous generation wasn't like us. We just, but I don't know. For some reason, it's like we evolved, but the love went some like that. That richness, that that foundation. To me personally, just speaking for myself, I felt like that went somewhere. And um, where where do you think? Where do you think that was lost in translation, or is it just just a shift? And um, I was gonna ask you, uh, what 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 part did you believe um the deaf uh poetry slam that you was a part of uh, several times um which is an iconic thing in our culture um what part do you think that played uh just for comedy you know uh mm, um, poetry comedy. music um, you know um well one deaf jam and deaf jam as a whole like what what, what do you think they right, that, that me, part they play you know for me that's such a that's such a that's such a loaded uh question it's such a I mean, that's a whole conversation in itself. Mm. Um, you know, um, man, so like, where do we start with that? Right? Because we, I mean, you know, we, they, they started us out here. Mm. Um, they erased our history. You know, they, 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 they de, you know, they, they dehumanized us. Those of us uh, that were in, that are indigenous to the land. And most of us are, I don't necessarily subscribe to, you know, the slave trade absolutely happened. I'm not mm. saying that, that didn't happen. That absolutely happened. Uh, I do think that they juked numbers. Mm. Um, the only way to kill a giant is to convince the giant that he's not one. Mm. You know, um, if we're familiar with American history, we know that black and white started after Bacon's Rebellion uh, Mm -hmm. in Virginia. Before that, you had pioneers, you had indentured servants, and those indentured servants were white, black, you know, uh, well, not even white, black. They were Polish, Irish, you know, Scottish, Asian, uh, and uh, and indigenous. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, maybe some Africans, but the Africans tend they they tend to hit the Caribbean. You know, they didn't come, you know, uh, so, um, and then when the the pioneers, the first, those first colonizers wasn't given what they said they were going to give, the revolts broke out. Mm. And because the indentured servants were all different kinds of cultures, you know, the colonizers said, well, it's, it's confusing. All right, well, we're going to make everybody, everybody black is illegal. And everybody white is legal. And so, you know, when you come from a place where uh, the oppressor, the oppressing force in your land has now burned all your history books, killed your storytellers, uh, uh, gave diseases to your, you know, to your family and then stereotyped you, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, you know, we grew up thinking that uh, Native Americans look like Tonto. Mm, yeah. We grew up with the picture of Chief Halftown and, and 
you know, the, the Plains Indians, you know, the Plains Native Americans, every Native American tribe up and down the East Coast look like us. Mm. They look like, go back and look at the pictures. They look like us. They didn't look like Tonto. So to erase our, our ancestors' history, the education, after we, after, after we welcome you, teach you, how to, teach you how to work the land, you know, because us, you know, people of color, people of the sun, we always commune, you know, mm-hmm. it's the Caucasian that'll eat his children. Mm. You know, and uh, and so what happens to a group of to a, a a culture of people who who literally go through a transition, a, a dark ages, you know, if you will, of a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred, you know, two hundred years of just being oppressed and 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 enslaved to where. You know, you're stripped of all your knowledge. You separating are, you're separating us from those that, those that speak the same language, same dialogue, same dialect. You separate us so that we can't communicate. And now here it is, two hundred years later. You force a, you force a religion on us. You know, and then justify what you're doing to us through the religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we're at this place where it's like, oh man, we can't trace ourselves past our great grandmothers mm. man what ha- when you if you start a people you know if you if a people if a culture of people think that their beginning is slavery everything else from there seems like progress mm. right Every, i mean everything must be up because we started out as slaves. Wow, what a hellified story to tell a people. Mm. And for some reason, the same people that you say, man, y'all ain't nothing, y'all dogs, y'all less than human. We inventing everything. Mm. Y'all got cloth, I, y'all got cloth around your feet. Mm. I'm here, here on my dumb slave ass. I done made a soul so that now you can have more wear and tear on you. You know, like we we mm. You know, all the the Thomas Edison's, the Jeff, all of these inventors that so-called invented everything, they didn't, they usually had two, three black boys in the room. Mm. And they was the one inventors. They just, they just couldn't get the patent. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I heard, so, I heard Dick Gregory say they, they they call us the savages and then they call them the settlers. And we the one who who civilized stuff. And I'm like, he dang, I never them. thought. Yeah, I, n- I never even thought about it like that. You know, um, I mean, but, Europe, but, you got to understand, like, your when we think Europe, right, you say Europeans, automatically the mind goes to the Caucasian. Mm. Right. It's just because European. But that's not Europe. That wasn't always Europe. Mm. The, the Moors civilized Europe. When the Moors came through, they were still eating with their hands. Mm. The Moors had silverware. They had soap. <laughs> you know, you people stink. <laughs> you say they had soap. They had manners. The Rosicrucians, you know, the first Illumin- Illuminati, the, the illuminated ones who came up with uh, uh, um, etiquette. These mm. is brothers, you know, the uh, uh, French royalty, black, early French royalty was black folk. Mm. Early English royalty was black folk. The Prince Hall Masons. There's a reason why they are the only Mason, Masonic order that has a true charter from the Queen of England. You know what I'm saying? Because at a certain point, Europe, Europe was not what Europe was not Caucasian. Europe was black. But you know? but it seemed it seemed like it was a period of enlightenment for black people for that type of information. Um you know what I'm that that black power movement. Mm-hmm. And um even even when the leaders of it were 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 seen to either be deceased or scattered, you know what I'm saying? Some perished, some were assassinated, others, you know, fled like James Baldwin and others. You mm-hmm. know, they had to scatter. 
But like, what was that disconnect that went from that era of love to a different era? Because I heard uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner on the Breakfast Club. He was talking about it was it was them taking the black family off the TV. You know, like it, it was all the black TV shows with the black a strong black family. They was taken off the TV, and then we was given like a replacement of something oh, like you know, single life or or the fast life and. It, uh, like I Absolutely. feel like the like Def, the Def Jam was the same way. Like Def Poetry, Poetry uh, um, Slam, Poetry Jam was the same thing. Like it was just that thing that 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 grounded art. It was the truth, you know. Like mm. Def Poetry was a was a you know Def Comedy was one thing, right? Because that mm-hmm. was that was meant to because black comics could not get into. Uh, um, uh, the laugh, the laugh houses and the laugh factories, you know, like they couldn't mm-hmm. get it. So that's why deaf, po- deaf comedy was invented to give black comics a, their own stage. Deaf poetry was created to give truth a stage. Mm. Unmitigated, raw, relating truth, right? Um, and not just black truth. Right. Because we realize you got the haves and the have nots. You know, they've duped us with racism, with, with bigotry, because most of us aren't racist because we don't have no power. You know what mm. I'm saying? You got to you got to you have to be able to hold something from a people to be a racist. Most people are just bigots. Mm. <laughs> you know, we, we've been you know, we, most people are just bigots. Right. So for me. Uh, strategically, they took the Cosby's off. They took different world off. They took schoolhouse rock off on Saturday mornings, you know, because uh, it's the same way they, they snatched the, uh, they defunded the schools and took all the, the first things to go were the arts and music program. Mm. You know, if you take the art, if you take arts and music away from public schools, what you just snatched was the, all of the character building components. Because the rest of that is compulsory. Mm. You know, they're teaching the tests. You know, you're learning simple arithmetic. You're learning, you know, that's compulsory. Where you learn who you are is through the arts. It's through being able to express yourself. And so when they defunded that, when they defunded the boys clubs, you know, and at the same time, it was 80s. You're defunding the boys' clubs. Now you got, and because it goes back earlier than that, you got Vietnam and, and, and military that snapped, drafted and snatched up all our fathers and uncles, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they go away to war, come back. They was like, everybody was strung out. Most, most men were strung out from, from poor communities because that's how they dealt with doing the killing you know, was they got high. And so they come back, they got these habits, they got heroin habits, you know, uh, not necessarily Coke habits because Coke didn't happen until the eighties. Coke was a, was a rich drug, you know, it was heroin and Tawa and, and alcohol that, that pillaged the, the black communities and the poor communities in the seventies, as mm-hmm. well as PTSD from soldiers coming home and then you had the welfare system, which was the big pimp. Mm. So the government steps to our, our our mothers and says, "Hey, I know you got them three kids, you know, and you it's hard it's hard to go. So I'm gonna give you this check, you know. Now, in order to get this check, I know you love your baby dad, but he can't be in this house, mm. you know. And to make sure you don't have no 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 man in this house." black woman with your with with those children to make sure you don't have a man in here i'm going to uh periodically randomly send inspectors out and mm. they're going to inspect your house and if they find one piece of male paraphernalia i'm stopping your check so what does that make the black mother do turn against the black father who i'm fresh home from the war I'm trying to kick this heroin habit that I had to pick up in order to kill for this white man. Mm. I'm fresh home. I got I got killing in my head. I can't even sleep. I've been killing for three years. I don't know how to be a dad. 
They stripped me of humanity and made me a killer. And I want to be a family man. And I know you want me to be a family man, but we got to put food on the table. Mm. And that dude's giving me, giving you a check. So what you going to do? Baby, you got to go. Cause I got to feed these kids. Right? So this is the seventies. You have black mothers having to disband their families. So you had a whole influx of black fathers mm. who were who went who who grew into manhood in a war. Because draft mm. come right off of high school. They spend four or five years, you know, in the jungle. They come home. Okay, I got when I they come home for, you know, they get they get leave in between tours. Come home, knock the, you know, knock the, the girlfriend up. Now the girlfriend's pregnant. Every time they come home, you know, now I got these big kids, but I also got killing on my mind. I can't sleep. Uh, I can't go earn. Right. I can't go earn because racism is still happening. I still can't get a job. I can't get a formidable job. And now this government is giving my, my woman a check that I can't mm. compete with. Mm. And they telling her if I'm here, they're going to cut that check off. I imagine a lot of noblemen left the house so that their kids could get taken care of. Mm. Big pimping, right? So mm. that's the 70s. Now you get to the 80s and the crack hits. So the crack hits, you know, and it's like, initially I think they, they put like heroin. The dealer will also be the user. But, you know, black folk were resilient. Next thing you know, we're pulling up at car dealerships with a hundred thousand cash. Like, I want that bend. So, mm. with, that, with that, the drug game gave black men pseudo self esteem, right? Because now I got a dollar. Now I can go back and I can stick my chest out to my kid's mom, you know, because black women were also being indoctrinated into, nigga, you ain't shit. Mm. And I don't need you. I'm an independent woman. They even they have interviews now where they admit to it that uh, um, Vogue magazine, all of these uh, women's magazines in the 80s, in the, set, in the late 70s and 80s, were promoting a false lifestyle of 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 independence in women. Like they literally are admitting to this now. Like they sold a false lifestyle to women at large and most poor women caught the victim, you know, were victims of that. Mm. You, know, you don't need that, man. You don't need it. And then the 90, 80s comes, crack hits, and we overcome that. You get you get cats when you look at the early hip hop, uh white lines and the message and like you know hip hop was quite conscious. Wasn't nobody like, oh yeah, you know, kill a nigga, fuck a bitch. It was, you know, white lines was about staying away from that coke. The message mm. was about being 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 a village, you know. So it changed, switched over. Then you get PE, public enemy, public enemy arrives, and that was revolutionary. For me, that was my that was my um, my hands on experience with what we could do as young people. To further, you know, to further our, our our cause, public enemy, because they came, and they came. They was leaning up on the ninety eight Oldsmobiles on the album cover. All of them had pistols, mm. and so it looked like, oh, they a gang, but they was a right starter gang. They didn't have pistols out, you know. The uh, S one W security of the first world, them cats actually knew martial arts. You know, um, and they were, and then when you started listening to what Chuck D was saying, 911 is a joke and public enemy number one. And when you first hear it's like public enemy number one, oh wow, he like wants some gangster shit. It's like, no, he means he's the government's public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. And so I watched black community, I watched the black community go from wanting from coveting big rope chains to wearing. African medallions. Ooh. The drug dealers was wearing African medallions. Mm. 
like everybody, like there was a sense of blackness that came over everybody. Now, this is at the same time that the Cosby show was on. Spike Lee was emerging. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, a different world was happening. When a different world was on, a Cosby show in a different world changed the scope of, of uh, progressive black America. Mm. You know, because we had, you know, we, you had Jefferson, you know, you had, uh, you had the Jeffersons, you know, uh, um, but then you had, you know, good times, what's good happening times, after yeah. poor life, you know what I'm saying? You know, but the Cosbys was like, mm. wow, these, this is a lawyer and a doctor with kids and they're having a regular black life. Like, you know, Bill was a black father. And then to, to add to it and start and create a different world, we watched, I watched everybody now have aspirations to go to college, black colleges. Mm. And then when they snatched all that away, what did they replace? They snapped, they, they, they uh, took public enemy down by calling them anti-Semites. Mm. You know, Griff said something and they got on. Oh, they're anti-Semitic. Nah, nah, nah. They slowly started dismant- dismantling public enemy. What do they replace public enemy with? Guys that look just like them. NWA. Mm. Same Raiders jackets, same Raiders hats, same guns. But these guys are talking about killing for no reason. Mm. You know, public enemy was talking about you know, fear of a black planet, you mm. know, uh, black steel in the hour, chaos, you know, mm. uh, right starter, 911 is a joke. Now you fuck the police, you know, but also uh, she swallowed it and all of the, you know, like all of the degradation that came over top of women. Mm. You know, this was the, this was that 80s to 90s transition. Public Enemy mm-hmm. out, NWA in. Because along with Public Enemy came King Sun, came uh, 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 X Clan. There were so many other conscious uh, native tongue. All of it. There's so many other conscious uh, MCs and rappers. Shit, Queen Latifah, MC Light, Moni Love. Our our female ra- our, our, our our female rappers in the late '80s. I mean, demanded respect. And then that transitioned to, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, boss, you know, where now you got this girl who looks like a street nigga. Mm. You know, she's emulating the street, you know, but you, and boss was a pretty woman, but they made her look like NWA. You know, they had to put the bandana on her and, you know, so, cause they wanted to change that image up. From boss came Lil' Kim, Foxy Brown, uh, uh, um, Trina, you know, then they pulled two live crew in, which was a Miami thing, Miami Beach, Miami base, bunch of women in bikinis. The rest of the world, the rest of the country didn't really see that. Up north, we didn't see women in bikinis. Mm. It's cold. You know what I'm saying? We mm-hmm. rarely saw women in bikinis. But Miami, it was a regular thing. But when they brought that up up north with the with the with the music and the gyrating. All of these things contribute. Like it wasn't just one thing. It was the Cosby show. The Cosby show, a different world getting, you know, uh, going off the air was one thing. But then you have hip hop and, the, and you know, and the and the uh, the acceleration of hip hop was another thing. The divide and conquer of hip hop and the music industry in general. You know, that was a whole nother thing, because now. You got black wealth, but black wealth is learning how to see the 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 uh, the, the the label runners. <laughs> we'll say that the 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 label owners took cats in like Russell. Um, you know, it was a handful of them took them in and taught them their game. Right, so when. These cats say, okay, I, I got the end with all of the rappers, so I'm going to bring them under, underneath me. So you mm. bring them underneath you, but you're, you're working with them in the same way that the owners would work with them. So you're really not creating no freedom. You know, if anything, you're just a henchman. 
Mm. It's doing their work, you know. So now we at the place where, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, cats are like, nah, I want, I want to own all mine. But all of that happened. It was the last, I mean, this man, it's such, it's such a heavy subject. Like it's the, yeah. the, the last, it's 2023. I want to say from 89 on, like 89 on, it was, you know, everybody said, oh man, 90s was the golden year of R&B. 90s was horrible. It was horrible music. We tore up hip hop and or otherwise. You listen to some of them R&B songs from the 90s, they're horrible. I mean, the lyrics are just horrible. They groovy. You know, Peace of My Love. It's a groovy song. Plenty of babies was made out of that. But let's look at the lyrics. You can't have all of me because I'm not totally free. I can't tell you everything is going on. This is what this nigga is singing. Mm. To a woman that you that you trying to make love to, the most divine act you can Engage in you saying you can't have all of me because I'm not totally free. I can't tell you everything that's going on. There's a few things in my past that should not be explained. I'm asking you to be with me for a little while. What? Mm. <laughs> like, so we're singing unaccountability. You know, and so we don't we don't understand. Most of us don't understand frequency. We don't understand trans mm. transmission. Like we don't, we're still on lyrics. We ain't even got to the frequency at which they feed this shit to us. You know, just the, the frequency, the resonance, the vibration that hits you. That 808 is deadly. It hits the body and hits the chakras in such a, a, a distorting way. So we haven't even got there yet. Mm. And we ain't even ready to talk <laughs> about that. We first, we got to get cast to stop saying, I'm going to fuck your mother. Mm. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. it's, so it's, 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 yeah, it's layered. It's, it's like, Ooh, it's so, man, like, it's, it's, it's <laughs> such a, it's such a diabolical mm. because we got to get into the prison industrial complex. Mm. We got to get into black fatherhood. We were all, we were hit, me and my homies, we talk about, we were good dads. I ain't know nothing mm. but I don't know no deadbeats. I don't even know good dads. Mm. 90s, you know how I many times I had my son with me on a Saturday or Sunday, and we move and we move around. I pull up on my man. What's up, baby? You know, man, you know, I got I got the junior with me, man. We hanging out. Yeah, I see mm. you know what I'm saying. That's what we do. We pop, you know what I'm saying? And know what, know what I'm listening to? And all that good dad shit. Know what's going on? Bitches ain't shit, but hoes and tricks. But a doogle doogle doogle. And my son is in the back. Two years old, mm -hmm. just sponging it in. And he just see dad doing this, so he gonna do that. Mm -hmm. We don't realize what kind of damage that did. You know, when my son is 25 now and has a disdain for society, we take some of that. We have to take some of that accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, and so... Uh, it, it when they got us to the place where we enjoy, we started enjoying killing each other. You know, which was NWA and the gang culture. You know, like all of that came down. So, it, it, and it's almost like they've been refining it. Mm. Like they'll they'll remix it and bring it back again. Like okay, well let's we gotta we gotta keep figuring out a way to keep the hat the have nots not having. We got to figure out a way to dumb down these 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 celestial people, you know, these earthly Anunnaki, because if we let them really, you know, cease their power, you know, the Caucasian in the Caucasian mind, because he'll eat his children. The Caucasian mind says we can't let them get power. They're going to kill us. They don't know. Mm. We don't know. We wouldn't. <laughs> that's not that's not the people we are. No. Nah. We're not, we're not of that people. This is why Mansa Musa came to Europe with all that bling. And them, and them Caucasians was like, what in the but you got gold chariots and this that and like that, man. We got all we, we, we man, we got plenty of that shit in Africa, man. Come on down, I'll show y'all. And they went down and pillaged. Mm. But look how mm. welcoming that cat was. Same thing with the indigenous people mm. over here. When they came over, 
Hey, how are y'all? How are y'all harvesting this? We will show you how to harvest, how to work this land. And I and I think it's it's it's, it's a lot of, at least on, on my end, I, I feel like um, it's it's a lot of promise that that I see, you know, um, because it's like you said, more ownership, more knowledge, more more information out here. And there's a lot of cats out here that's just doing it different. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of factions and, and powers that it, is going to collide with that. You know, a lot of people who have the talent don't have the business sense. And mm -hmm. the people who have the business sense can't get to the people. Because like you said in the beginning of the conversation, the algorithm, the algorithm will definitely, and people don't understand that's a whole nother conversation once you're whole spreading a certain message. Can't even, that we still ain't, we still not coding. Mm. Yeah, we have, we ain't got the algorithms yet. We we still don't know how to code. Mm. But I wanted to, I wanted to ask because because we, we we are pushing the time. But I wanted to ask if you could if you could end us off with 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 a poem. I, I don't know if you have any that you uh well I I know you you probably got a rolodex of them. But if you have one that you think would be fitting for the conversation, it, it would be an honor if you could mm. bless us with a poem. Mm. Um. You know, like, uh, 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 I'll, give you, I'll give you two, right? One, uh, Imagine, right? I'm a big, a big John Lennon fan. Like, I'm just a really pro peace guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, you know, what happens in neighborhoods where the self esteem has been overshadowed by the decay and the children no longer play the way they used to? where young boys choose to follow figures that had no father figures, a place where lives have been reduced to mere names on a nigga wall. A lot of dead chains on a nigga wall because most of my childhood friends died over some dumb shit. It's like we all on some slum shit. Whatever happened to that, we shall overcome shit. Where I'm from, shit. They done took away boys clubs and neighborhood sports. It's a place where little boys put on jerseys and shorts, dream big about stardom on fine hardwood courts, but awake to the harsh reality of the stripped, unfinished inner city floor where life splinters. Cold winters are sheltered by crack houses instead of recreational centers that they claim to not have the paper to keep open for operation. The deconstruction of the black family has been in perpetuation ever since Willie Lynch set his theory in motion. Decharacterization was his sole promotion, therefore, if you take the basketball out of his face and put the coke in its place, he'll still score. What's a young boy to do when he doesn't want to do wrong, but there's a lock on the right pole? When he has the heart of a soldier, the aggression of a prize fighter, but no one's taught him what to fight for. See, most of our families are fatherless and quite poor, so we miss out, we miss out on meals as well as kisses and hugs. You've got the audacity to cut the funding for the facilities to keep us off the streets, then ask us why we sell drugs, but... Imagine if we put down our dice and guns, picked up our daughters and sons and put a little love right there where the hate is. Imagine if we had the chance to become accountants before being taught what the difference between wet and dry weight is. Imagine if these little inner city kids had the same type of schools that these rich kids have way out there in the sticks. Imagine if niggas had the chance to learn chemistry for real before we learned how to whip seven and a half out of six. Imagine if that little black girl could go to that dance school for free and learn to love the dream of that Broadway show. Imagine she was forced. Imagine she wasn't forced into a game where you assume a filthy name and put your soul and your ass up the show. Imagine mm. she was taught to love herself, imitate no one, demand and demonstrate respect when she walks through the door. Imagine she watched the telly and saw herself during the primetime hour instead of the four o'clock video whore. Imagine. Mm. Mother should say, uh, reporting live from the murderous streets of the brotherly. Helicopters that hover see everything under the sun here. We under the gun here, finger on the trigger, can't mistake the stench the way it linger on a nigga, yeah. You got gold you'll find covered here. Where bodies dead, three days old get discovered here. You know the place where naughty here kids don't get mothered here. Familiar face, failure is fed firsthand, success will kill your taste. This way they hide it once decided they gonna slight your race. It's customary to cut your nose so you can spice your face. The cops invade your space with the strong arm and the wrong with the law is cock diesel. It's hard to fight the case. This is where they smite his grace and take swigs of sweet sorrow and hopelessness with a shot of pain for the chase. This is where the dreams end up in staircase nightmares by the shotgun. This is where the light dares not come. It's dark here. 
But you feel the heat when hammer spark here. The pen is mighty, but the sword rain. So watch your talk here. Silhouetted and chalk here. Shots fired, fun, dead at kids running. Look out fast to park clear. Nigga, why you staring? Watch your gawk here. You'll be the next where the paramedics leaning over yelling clear. Yeah, this is where the beasts roam. They walk about, but everybody's silent, man. Don't nobody talk about the unspeakable. Where girls go clubbing with their mothers and cats is closer to their street friends than their own brothers and shit. We think nobody love us and we put everything but God above us and take what scraps they shove us. Consumers, not owners, we copping what they tagging and selling. We bragging and yelling on what we can't afford to and they applaud you for pretending sober. You spin until that spinning's over. Note on that rover, it got you bending over. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Man, I appreciate you, brother. This is this has been this has been the one. This is the one I needed. This um, this is the culmination. This is powerful. Uh, heavy talkers. That's what we need to call this. Heavy talkers, man. Hey, listen, man I we, appreciate. I mean, you know, we might as well. We might. We might as well just schedule it out because we got. We have so much to talk about. Yes. And everybody's talking, but nobody's talking. What? Like nobody's having these conversations, right? Mm. There's so many. Like everybody's just gossiping. It's a lot of, you know, paparazzi podcasts going on. Everybody's just talking about everybody else. You know, everybody else's lifestyle. I don't care about nobody else's lifestyle. I care about life. Mm. You know, and um, I would lo- I would love to, to, to uh, do something deliberate where we actually tackle and discuss some things that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, other cats just not, they're not thinking about discussing it. You know, mm. not to say that they're not even concerned. We might be the ones to to bring it to the forefront. Mm. You know, it's it's that thing of you you got some greatness in you. You've you got greatness in you. You've, you've created platforms uh, that have extreme following, so you know that the food that you're serving is feeding us well. Mm. A, a lot of times we've been indoctrinated and kind of trained to think that we ain't the only person think that, that thought that shit up. Mm. Right. You know, how many times you've thought of something and you like, man, I know somebody else that came up with that shit. <laughs> no, bro. Yeah. Nah. Like going back to what my mom said, don't be afraid of your greatness. Don't second mm. guess. that. I, I started living into that. Like, Yo, no, you know what? I might be the, I might be the first cat that thought that up. Now mm. I put the vibration out there, so now it's out there. Somebody else on my frequency will catch it mm. if I don't execute on it. So now that we're saying this, we got to execute on it because we'll look up and like, damn, that's a... <laughs> we got to make a form. We got to make a form. We we got to talk. I, I want to call it, it, it got to be a spinoff of poetry, something. It, it's powerful, but we... We brainstorm about it and bring it to life. Let's do it. I appreciate you for doing this episode with me, man. Uh, this yeah, is a powerful, anytime, man. powerful anytime, conversation. I know I get Make the sure ramble, so. No, 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 no. This is this is this is perfect. This is perfect conversation, and um, I know they got a lot of gems, a lot of a lot of good food for thought from this powerful conversation, man. Make sure y'all stay tuned in for the next episode, yes, um, and y'all y'all catch us um in the next one. Appreciate y'all. Stay tapped in. Peace. Peace.